All right, so I mentioned uh, killer women in the audience. <laughs> and uh, another of my good friends is Sangeeta Bhatia, who is an MD, PhD, and a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator, as well as the John J. and Dorothy Wilson Professor of Health Sciences and Technology and Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. Now, uh, Sangeeta is also an MIT Limousin Prize winner and just won in 2014. So uh, we're very proud of the fact that we have two Limousin Prize winners working on ovarian cancer right here in the audience. Uh, this is the second consecutive year uh, that we've had uh, a Koch Institute member win uh, the Limelson Prize, and we also have a third prize winner. Bob Langer won it back in 1998. Uh, now, I want to mention that Sangeeta is also a multidimensional inventor. With a PhD from MIT and an MD from Harvard, she is poised to impact human health as an engineer, as a doctor, and as a scientist. Her collaborative ability to identify and solve clinical problems by connecting miniaturization to medicine is exemplified by her passion of inventions uh, that address complex problems in dr of drug toxicity, tissue regeneration, cancer therapeutics, and non-invasive diagnostics and infectious disease. She is particularly passionate about applying high-tech solutions to under-resourced settings globally. And uh, we're very excited to hear what she's going to have to talk about. Uh, I'd like to welcome Sangeeta to the stage. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a real pleasure and a privilege to be here. Can everyone hear me OK? No. No, it turns out. OK. Let's try it. So good afternoon. So I was saying it's a, a pleasure and a privilege to be here today and to chat with you this afternoon about some of our work. Um, kind of diagnostic that we think may help with early diagnosis. And you're going to be hearing about that um, later in the program from a former trainee um, of mine and of the Koch Institute who's just started his lab at Georgia Tech, Abe Kwan. See him here. Um, and I thought what I would tell you about is sort of to build on Paula's story about siRNA. Um, and in particular, to talk to you a little bit about how the community has used samples from patients um, with their consent to try and identify genes that are vulnerabilities um, for which RNAi can impact the disease. Um, so let me just sort of walk you through how this, this works. Um, in 2006, uh, the National Cancer Institute launched something called the Cancer Genome Atlas uh, for ovarian cancer. What they did was invest about $275 million and trying to create a map of the cancer genome of ovarian cancer. They focused on uh, primary serous ovarian tumors, and they took 489 samples from patients and sequenced the genomes. And this, um, the idea here is that if you're going to identify vulnerabilities, Paula told you about one, if you're going to identify them all over the genome, you basically need a roadmap. Um, so that was done over the course of the next five years. And in 2011, um, this really large consortium um, published their findings and they created a map for the community. And what they found was about 1,800 genes um, were recurrently amplified. And what that means is in the sequence of the DNA, these genes were duplicated. Okay, so they're, excuse me. I think we lost it. That will turn you down. The podium is off. <laughs> this is MIT. We're very good yeah. at this. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. How much shall I repeat? It's a, okay. pleasure. it's a pleasure and a privilege. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so over 
over the last, from 2006 to 2011, a roadmap of the ovarian cancer genome was made with the investment of the federal government and, um, and the consent of about 500 patients. And that uh, roadmap of the ovarian cancer genome is what we collectively as researchers can use to try and identify vulnerabilities in the cancer genome. So there are about 1,800 genes. Um, in the ovarian cancer genome that are amplified, so that is, there are multiple copies of them, okay? And that might mean that if we turn them down with some kind of silencing technology, that we could impact the tumors. That's sort of the idea. So first we have the roadmap, um, but, oops, I mean, a lot of technical difficulties. So just because something is duplicated in the genome, right, so just because you have a map and there's more copies of something, doesn't necessarily mean that the cancer cells need those genes to survive anymore because cancer cells can evolve over time. Okay, so they have multiple copies in their genome, but they're not necessarily essential for cancer cell survival. So we've been working with collaborators at the Broad Institute who have been asking a related question and kind of trying to filter this data to give us a shorter list of things that are both amplified in the genome, but for which we think cancer cells need for survival, okay? So we call that amplified and essential. If something is amplified and essential, it might be a good target for silencing, a better target than just looking at all 1,800. Is that clear? Okay. So what our colleagues did at the Broad um, was create a library of now ovarian cancer cell lines. So these are samples that have come from patients that have consented to share them. And we grow them in the lab. This work was done by Bill Hahn. And they did this with 25 different tumors. Okay, so this is a little different than sequencing a cancer genome. This is now growing cells from, from the tumors. You have 25 of these, and you take those, and you, in those, you silence every single gene in the genome of those cells, okay, using the silencing technology that Paula described. And then you ask, when do those cells die? Okay, so which genes were required for those ovarian cancer cell lines to live on? Okay, and then you get a list. Okay, so when they take that list of essential genes in the ovarian cancer cell lines, which we think are not a perfect proxy for tumor samples, but if you take that list and you cross it with the genes that seem to be amplified in the primary ovarian cancer tumors, you get a much shorter list, okay? And so these are the targets. So of these 1,800 genes that were amplified, Bill and his colleagues found 206 genes that were also essential. Okay, so. That's sort of the genomic story. And then they came to us and said, how can we actually tell in a, in a model of ovarian cancer, let's say a mouse model of ovarian cancer, if we knock these down, if the ovarian tumors will regress, okay? And so that's the sort of story I want to tell you about today, which we try to address with a nanotechnology. Okay, so um, Paula already told you about RNAi, which um, is a way to silence genes like these. And um, the reason that we think this is such an attractive way to silence genes like these is that many of these genes make proteins. They all make proteins. These happen to all make proteins. They make proteins, but not all of the proteins can be inhibited by a drug, okay? So some of them we can make structures of, and we can see that there's what we call a druggable pot. And so those are drugs that drug companies can make drugs against. It will take a long time. Um, but there are others that don't have druggable pockets. And it's by some estimates, 85% of the whole genome is what we call undruggable. So the really great thing about RNAi, about silencing things before they become proteins, RNAi silences things when they're messenger RNA, before they become proteins. And the great thing about that is that you don't have to have a druggable protein. Right, so anything that pops up as amplified and essential is theoretically targetable by RNAi. Okay, so Paula told you a little bit about RNAi, and I just sort of want to go over again kind of how it works, which is basically we're trying to deliver this duplex of charged nucleic acids um, that's called siRNA into cells. And if it gets into cells, it can basically degrade 
these green messenger RNAs by using this as a code, okay? So that's the goal, is to get this stuff inside the cells of interest. And we're gonna try and carry a sequence against genes that we think the cells will be vulnerable to. Okay, so um, this is what the experiment looks like in cell culture. This is sort of a really classic example um, from the earliest days of RNAi. And basically what you wanna see there is that when this has been done in cell culture, uh, the red protein is silenced. You see that in the top left? and it's sequence specific. So the green protein, which is also in all those cells, is not silenced, okay? So those cells have been given this duplex that carries the code for silencing the red protein. And in ovarian cancer, the idea is that we want to give the sequence that will carry the code for the vulnerabilities that have come out of the ovarian cancer genome work that I told you about. Okay, so Paula told you this, and I'll reinforce it, this is very hard. Um, <laughs> But we're working on it, and we think that nanotechnology holds some promise for packaging these charged nucleic acids and, and helping deliver them inside tumors and inside the cells of interest, okay? And so um, the reason it's hard is shown here. So if we give an injection, we've talked about IV delivery or IP delivery. Um, in either case, these nucleic acids have to survive in the body. If they're a given IV, they have to get across the blood vessel wall, right? That's the endothelium. They have to travel to the cancer cell through the scaffolding of the tissue. That's called extracellular matrix. They have to get inside the cell. When the cell engulfs things, it often puts a, um, it often um, puts a bilayer around them and sort of entraps them. You don't want your cargo in there. You actually want the cargo in the cytoplasm of the cell where it can do the degradation I talked about. So you have to get through the circulation, across the endothelial wall, through the extracellular matrix, inside the cell, out of this compartment we call the endosome, and inside the cytoplasm of the cell. And if you can get the right sequence there, then you can get silencing of the protein of interest. Okay, and so the, the idea here is that maybe we could design nanomaterials that could do this sort of shepherding of this cargo. Okay, so the way that we went about this was to take advantage of some molecular zip codes that had been discovered by a collaborator of ours that helped shepherd nanomaterials to tumors in mouse models. And our idea was to take these molecular zip codes, package siRNA inside them, and then use those materials to try and silence genes of interest. Okay, so the experiment that our colleague Erki Ruslati did to find the molecular zip codes is shown here. So here what they do is they take an animal that has a tumor, a human tumor, and they inject inside it a library of biological nanoparticles. These are called phage, and they're related to the phage that Angie talked about earlier, okay? So they are about 50 nanometers big, and they all have 400 copies of a particular amino acid sequence on their surface, okay, peptides. And what happens is basically you inject these, about a billion of them, into the animal that has a tumor, and then you harvest the tumor and you ask which sequence targeted this biological nanoparticle to the tumor, okay? And that becomes a candidate. And so the way this experiment looks in the lab is that if you collect the tumor and the other organs from this animal, you can see in this case the biological nanoparticle, the phage, carried a fluorescent marker. Here you can see the tumor is lighting up because the biological nanoparticle homed in on the tumor and it didn't go into the other organs. Okay, and so this sequence that was on its coat 400 times became a sequence that we wanted to borrow to shepherd siRNA into the tumors. Yeah? Okay. All right, so this is the design of our nanoparticle, and it has two parts that are important. So the first is that it has to have this molecular zip code, and the second is that it has to find a way to bind the cargo, right, to form a particle. So the way we did that is we used what we call a tandem peptide. So there's the molecular zip code part, and then there's a second part, and this part is charged. And it's the opposite charge of the siRNA. And so the idea is when you mix them together, you would get that charge complexation that Paula talked about, and you would get a particle, okay? And the particle would carry the molecular zip code, and it would protect the siRNA um, and shepherd it into the tumor. Okay. So 
this data is just to say we tried a lot of these. And um, this is our winner. This is our favorite. Um, and these particles, um, like the high magnification view graphs that Paula showed you, are about 100 nanometers. So these are a different flavor of nanoparticle than the one you've seen before. And these are uh, decorated with these molecular zip codes, and they carry the SI RNA. OK. So this is um, how we imagine this might be working for see if this works. This uh, cargo is going through the circulation. And it's binding to the blood vessel uh, receptors through the molecular zip code. And I skipped a bunch of details <laughs> about how this works. But basically, an enzyme activates it when it gets there. And now it's going through the extracellular matrix of the tumor to the tumor cell of interest, where it gets internalized. And then out of that compartment I mentioned, and they're trapped. Okay, So that's how we think these are working. Um, OK, so I told you that the whole point of this was to try and target genes that we thought were vulnerable based on the sequencing that had been done in the Cancer Genome Atlas. And so the question is, there were still actually quite a few to choose from. How do we choose? So we relied on our collaborators um, to make good choices. And this was their favorite that they nominated for us. They really wanted to see if it was responsible for tumor maintenance and tumor progression. Um, so it's a gene called ID4, and when they looked back in the genome, they found that it was in the genome, it was amplified in 30% of high-grade serous ovarian cancer. So not all of them, but 30% of them at the genome level carried a lot. And then the other thing they did was look on something um, that we call human tissue microarrays. So this is another way in which patient samples actually really help research. And for those of you who don't know about them, what's done is a little tiny sample of tumors are taken and they're spotted onto slides. And so we can have slides with samples from 100 different patients, and then we can stain them and see which ones actually express high levels of the protein of interest. Okay, so when we did that, 30% of them had amplification of the genome, but actually 80% of them had high levels of protein. So it was even better when we looked at the protein level across a sample of patients. Okay. And the encouraging thing was when we looked in all other normal tissues, including normal ovary and normal fallopian tube, we didn't see high levels of this protein. And so for us, that's also really encouraging because that means that when we silence it, there's um, less tendency to have side effects, right? It's going to be more specific for the ovarian cancer. OK, so this is what happened when we did the experiment. We did the experiment two ways. Um, this is the first experiment. And so essentially what you're looking at is here the tumor is growing in a mouse model. And there's a bunch of different controls. And here we're giving our nanoparticle that's targeted, that's carrying siRNA against the gene of interest, ID4, both IV and IP. And you can see these tumors are growing much slower. And when we actually look at the tumors for markers of cell death, when we give the drug IP, we see a lot of cell death, which is very encouraging. Um, in the next experiment, we wanted to see whether there was tumor regression. So we picked a more aggressive model of ovarian cancer. And here, we were able to see um, better survival um, in this mouse model of ovarian cancer. So again, um, this was very encouraging. So the way we kind of think about this coming together is that there's um, a pipeline of research in the field that we like to accelerate, to bring it back to patients. Um, so we started with the amplified genes in the ovarian tumors that we got from sequencing. And then we're working with the Broad. We found out which ones were important for the cells to survive. And then now we have these nanoparticles that can ask in a mouse model which ones can cause tumor regression and improve survival. And that has two benefits. On the one hand, we hope to take these formulations forward towards the clinic. Of course, that's what we're, one thing that we're working on. But the other thing it can do is for those proteins which are druggable, which have structural pockets, they can now be what we call validated for the community. Now that you see that it cause, if it causes increased survival in a mouse model, if they're druggable, then one would be interested in making drugs against them. So we think there's kind of a twofold benefit of this approach. And because RNAi is so modular, as Tyler mentioned, you can pretty quickly actually go from a new sequence of interest to a result. 
Whereas before, um, at least using old mouse genetics, it would take quite some time. Um, okay, so um, I just want to thank you for your attention and um, the community here. Uh, it's really wonderful to be a part of um, such passionate and uh, tightly integrated researchers, and it's an honor to be here and uh, share our work with you. This is my um, group. We just took this this afternoon, so it's <laughs> super. <laughs> thank you. Out of curiosity, is, uh, is it possible that there will be an immune reaction to the delivery of these particles when you inject them, or they are totally non-immunogenic? So uh, that's a great question. So in the, de in the development of our nanomaterials, there are several dimensions on which we look at their safety. One is immunogenicity, um, and especially things that carry peptides. Um, for which antibodies are made against, that would be one axis we would look at. And there's others, like how quickly they degrade, whether there's an allergic response. And so all this whole collection of safety tests um, are something that we do kind of at a first level, and then we can work with the NCI to, they have a whole panel of assays for formulations we want to advance um, to, to vet them more thoroughly. So, so far, these peptides have not been immunogenic, but we would need to do much more on that. Thank you. One of the problems in um, drug treatment of cancer is that single drugs maybe aren't as effective. You need combinations of drugs. So you, can you comment on that problem from the perspective of siRNA technology and what it might enable? Sure. Yeah, that's a great comment. So I, th I sort of alluded to the modularity of siRNA, which is that once you have a delivery vehicle, and Paula did too, once you have a delivery vehicle, you can package different things. Um, but Tyler's pointing out that you don't actually have to package just one silencing agent. You could package multiple silencing agents. And in addition, with Paula's work, you could package a drug, right? So the way um, our colleague Bob Langer likes to talk, this is, talk about this is many shots on goal. Um, and so this, I think, is a uh, you know, for, for most cancer chemotherapeutic regimens nowadays, they actually are combination drugs, and we can like to think that RNAi could be similar. So with these drugs that you can um, go in and nano, whatever, <laughs> um, does it have the same side effects, such as hair loss and neuropathy, and since it's not going to be systemically put through such as, you know, with Taxol and Carboplatinum? Will it have the same side effects? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, all drugs have their own, what we call maximum tolerated dose. So there's always some side effect of any medicine at high doses. Um, we think that the side effects will be different. So the big problem in nanomedicine is actually that your body is a natural filter for nanoparticles. Um, and the natural filters in your body are the liver and the spleen. So um, when you give a nanoparticle dose, actually what's dose limiting is the liver and the spleen, which naturally want to filter those nanoparticles out. And so we think the side effects will be slightly different than just the rapidly dividing cells, um, which are the current side effects. And so again, those will need to be tested. Additional questions? All right. If those are all the questions from our audience, let's thank uh, Sangeeta one more time.